So as Tom mentioned, uh, my name is Matt Nallen. I'm uh, associate professor in political science here at the College of Charleston, and um, my work is in environmental policy and politics uh, broadly. Um, so what I'm going to talk about today is some of my work in uh, public opinion and how the public views environmental issues, particularly um, climate change. And this is in, in many ways a uh, still a work in, in progress. So this is um, some work that I hope to uh, send for publication in, in, the, in the coming months. But I, I recently presented this uh, as a paper at a, a American Political Science uh, Conference. Um, and so I'm excited to uh, present it here today. Um, and so just briefly, what I'm going to be talking about, um, I'm going to provide a little bit of background on sort of public opinion around climate change. Um, there's been a lot of a lot written, a lot of ink spilled on this question of there's this strong scientific consensus about climate change. So why do people disagree? Um, so I'm going to talk through briefly some of the kind of leading answers to that question or or um, ways in which scholars in the literature have talked about um, those disconnects in public opinion. Um, and then the uh, analysis that I'm going to discuss is examining the various kinds of climate change beliefs or beliefs about climate change that have been shown in the literature. Um, going to analyze those as, as a network. Um, so this is coming from some work in psychology. Scholars have 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 begun to measure belief systems as as networks. Um, and when you when you measure a belief system as a network, you can use some of the same um, understandings and uh, methods of analysis that you can in other types of network, like like a social network or an information network. But in a belief system network, the nodes are the beliefs. Uh, beliefs themselves, and then the uh, um, edges or ties or connections are the associations between those beliefs. And so doing that kind of analysis, we can get a sense of what the overall structure of the belief system around climate change, uh, what that looks like, and then also use some centrality measures to determine which of those beliefs are most central. And in particular, I, I use a measure of, of centrality called betweenness centrality, with, which gets at what um, beliefs or nodes stand in the path uh, between different kinds of beliefs. So in a social network, betweenness is associated with information carriers, but in a belief system network, this betweenness measure is associated with uh, influence uh, in terms of, of influencing uh, other beliefs. Uh, so that's a little bit about what I'm going to talk about. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, again, a lot of ink has been dedicated to this question of why is there such a disconnect in, in beliefs? Um, and I, I, I should mention, I've, I've already had a question uh, raised about uh, thinking in terms of climate beliefs and, and what does that mean? Um, so in this context, we're, we, we mean beliefs as, as something that someone believes to be true, right? So and so we're interested in exploring why people believe things to be true, to the extent that they are true or to the extent that what their beliefs match up with the best scientific evidence um, is, of course, an, an important question that um, that we also consider. But but when we're studying beliefs, we are interested in what people believe and how those beliefs are connected. And so there, there are several um, common um reasons for disagreement on climate change among the public in particular. Um, and so um, I'm just going to, I'll mention them briefly and then, and then talk about each one in a little more depth, I'll, except for the sort of knowledge deficit idea. So that's the first one. It's an italics. Um, uh, that's because that, so this knowledge deficit idea is, is, is this idea that people disagree about climate change because they don't have enough information, that they just don't know enough about the science, or they just don't know enough about the scientific consensus, or they just don't know enough. And so um, that's where this, that's the source of these divisions, or this is, that's where that divide comes from. Um, but, you know, but there's been a lot of work that's shown that, that that's not the case, or at least it's not a complete explanation. And, and then in fact, those that are more highly educated, those that have more science literacy, 
uh, have been shown to be more polarized on climate change, not less. So in other words, a, uh, a conservative Republican that went to college uh, is less likely to think that climate change is happening or a risk than a conservative Republican that, that, that did not go to college. Um, so it's clear that there's more going on than just this sort of lack of knowledge. And so some of the um, uh, explanations that have been put forward in the literature include things like political beliefs, uh, cultural worldviews derived from cultural theory. Um, this is an area and I've I've done some uh, some work in. Um, degrees of environmental orientation, particularly using a scale called the new ecological paradigm. Uh, this idea of the scientific consensus acting as kind of a gateway belief. So there's some studies that have shown that in an experimental setting, if you present respondents with information that there is a scientific consensus about climate change, um, they are more likely, regardless of their political affiliations, to uh, think that climate change is happening, to be supportive of action, uh, more so than those that were given some other kind of, of prompt. Uh, and then a final explanation is this idea of solution of aversion, which which I think is particularly interesting, where um, uh, it's not so much climate change in particular, but it's the solution, particularly in terms of government regulation, that some folks find uh, objectionable. So if they are opposed to the solution, which is government regulation, then they kind of reason themselves backwards to say that if that's the solution, right, then this must not be a problem. Um, so again, I'll, I'm going to run through some of these in a little more um, depth. I think political beliefs, ideology, and partisanship, I think is one that we're all familiar with. Right? It's been clear for, for years and years that conservatives and Republicans view climate change differently than liberals and Democrats. There's been, you know, about, right around 90, 1994, we see a, a split on environmental issues among conservatives and Republicans and liberals and Democrats in the public. Sort of elite split happened uh, prior to that. Um, and so by the um, uh, discussions about the Kyoto, Proto, uh, Kyoto Protocol, actually, as, as, as Keeley and I were discussing um, before the talk, um, that around the time of the Kyoto Protocol is when the partisan or ideological divisions around climate change really, uh, really started to, to happen. And so we so we know that that this um, uh, it has existed for, for years. And, and there's some more recent research to show that this is much more a top down or elite driven kind of phenomenon that that the public are picking up cues from elected officials in political parties that they support or they're listening to media sources that confirm or um, uh, their kinds, their 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 partisan leanings, right? And this is very much a a, a top down approach. So elites became skeptical of climate change uh, before the public did, and the public followed. So there's some some research to suggest that that's that's the case. And in in one article in particular, the Krosnick et al. piece, 2006, really points to the debate, the polarization around the debate of around the Kyoto Protocol. Um, that really started to drive a wedge in um, in climate change beliefs among the public. Um, and so I'm going to go through this kind of kind of quickly. Um, if you're not familiar, I'm happy to answer some questions. And I'll when I get to the measurement discussion, I'll I'll show some of the questions that we that scholars use to measure these different cultural worldviews. Um, but cultural theory is is started as a um, from a, as a as a theory in anthropology from Mary Douglas. It was brought over to uh, political science and social science more broadly by Aaron Wadowski, is a political scientist, and it, it was originally understood as, as a way of understanding risk. Um, and in in brief, cultural theory posits that there are two cross-cutting dimensions: um, a grid dimension and a group dimension. And when we combine these dimensions, um, that generates these four viable what cultural theory scholars have called ways of life or what we more commonly call cultural worldviews that point to what um, I idealized social relationship and social structures might look like. Um, so as I mentioned, it's two cross-cutting dimensions. There's a grid dimension that 
reflects importance of rules and clearly defined social roles. So the more it's important to you to have a clear sense of the, of the rules and who belongs where uh, in society, the higher you are in the grid dimension. The less that's important, the lower you are in the grid dimension. Uh, the group dimension uh, reflects uh, the importance of group cohesion and, and well-being. So high on the group dimension, you're concerned about, you're a little more collectivist, more concerned about the overall well-being of the group as opposed to individual uh, well-being even. And so when we combine these two dimensions, we come up with four um, cultural types, and there are some associated myths of nature uh, with each of these cultural types. So in briefly, combining grid and group, uh, high grid and high group, we have hierarchs or hierarchical cultural type that tend to see nature as pretty tolerant to what it is that that humans do to nature, as long as it's well managed. Um, again, because it's that hierarchical um, uh, understanding. And then um, moving clockwise, I think, <laughs> on the low grid, high group uh, is the egalitarian uh, cultural world worldview, um, which sees nature as easily harmed, as fragile, uh, and easily harmed. Uh, and then moving over to the low grid, low group, it's a kind of individualist cultural worldview that sees nature as robust, uh, as able to uh, to be used as a resource by, uh, by humans. Uh, and then finally, uh, high grid but low group uh, is the, the fatalist kind of worldview that sees things and events as happening as, as being essentially random or capricious. And so looking at um, views about uh, climate change, and again, this is derived from views about or myths of nature and views about the environment. Generally, what we see is that egalitarians, those that have that low grid but high group, tend to be those that are most concerned about environmental issues, uh, including climate change. Uh, individualists tend to be the least concerned about environmental issues or, or, or climate change. Again, they're on that low group, low grid. Um, hierarchs are kind of interesting. They tend to be a little mixed and there's some work that has shown that 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 um, it kind of depends on a hierarch's ideological um, uh, or partisan leanings. Uh, it shapes where they sort of fall on, on an issue like climate change. So. Uh, in other words, it kind of depends on who they see as, as on top and, and of the hierarchy, right? Is, is it scientists based on scientific expertise? Then they'll be more likely to think or more concerned about climate change. Or is it, you know, political actors, political leaders, um, or faith leaders, right? Then, then they may have different views about, about climate change. Uh, and then fatalists tend to not be concerned. Uh, again, every, you know, nothing is in... Uh, the control of humans, right? It, it's all uh, sort of random. So why be concerned about it? Um, and so you you may be familiar also with uh, cultural cognition. And I just want to say this uh, as a kind of a brief aside. Um, so this work by Dan Kahan and his colleagues. So cultural cognition, if you're familiar, is, is, is a um, derivative of cultural theory. Um, but it measures cultural worldviews a little bit differently. So it has a grid dimension that goes from hierarch to egalitarian, and it has a group dimension that goes from individualist to communitarian. So it, and the question, the item um, on the items on the survey are, are uh, a little bit different. So it has some different measures. Uh, and it also incorporates more of that cognition piece. So uh, these cultural worldviews, really don't just kind of tell us what to think in terms of issues like climate change or what to believe in, in terms of issues like climate change, but also how to process that information. So it's got the motivated reasoning and these other kinds of cognitive mechanisms um, that are associated with cultural cognition in, in, a, in, a, in a deeper theoretical way um, than they were in the original um, uh, cultural theory. And so some of the so again so uh, Dan Kahan and his colleagues have done a lot of work on on climate on climate change. One of their more most cited pieces is you know sort of is the one that shows 
this distinction between hierarch individualist and egalitarian communitarians, um, that those divisions increase among respondents that have more science literacy, right? So again, it's not this sort of knowledge deficit, um, or at least it's not only a knowledge deficit, right? It's these cultural worldviews and how they shape information and information processing that, that matter. Oops. Um, and so there's also been work on broader environmental orientation using the scale called the new ecological paradigm. Um, and so this is a quote from, from Dunlap, who's one of the um, uh, developers of this scale. Um, but this research grew in, in the 70s and early 80s when it was first developed, and it grew out, out of the environmental movement that saw the relationship between human growth and nature um, differently than what at the time they these scholars called the dominant social paradigm, which was basically uh, you know free market on 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 steroids kind of approach, right that that nature is just a resource to use um, where they noticed this rising sort of environmental consciousness that they label uh, that they label the new e ecological paradigm. And so there are some questions that, that we'll see that kind of measure where folks are on this, this scale from the kind of dominant social paradigm where, um, you know, nature is for human use and development to nature is, is deserving of protection and, and fragile. Um, and then there's been a work that shows a more pro-environmental orientation, it, it, again, more concern for the environment and the natural world is associated with, with concern about climate change. Uh, and then, as I mentioned, there's a lot of work that has shown the scientific consensus can act as kind of a gateway belief. Um, it is uh, it's ex an experimental design where some respondents are, are given a prompt that discusses the scientific consensus on climate change uh, and other respondents are given a different prompt. And then, um, what this work has shown is that exposure to this consensus message as opposed to some other uh, con you know, controlled kind of message um, tends to lead towards agreement about climate change and increased support for, uh, for climate action. Uh, and then finally, this uh, notion of, of solution aversion. And what, what this is, specifically is, is a way of explaining, or one possible way of explaining why there's this polarization among conservatives, Republicans, and liberals and Democrats with regard to climate change. Um, as you know, as I mentioned that um, it, with this research, right, the argument is that uh, the opposition to the solution like government regulation, then in turn leads to skepticism about um, the problem, right? So the, the logic sort of works like this, right? Climate change involves solutions have been put forward to in, involve government regulations, right? And so if we you know, remember that a, a, a lot of the polarization over climate change grew during the time that the Kyoto Protocol was being discussed, and that was a um, framed at least as, as being um, as sort of an imposition um, by other, by the rest of the world on the United States in terms of its energy use and um, and and putting limits on on economic development is how that was seen, right? And so, um, so this was seen as a kind of government regulation. And if you are a conservative or Republican, you tend to be more skeptical of government's ability to address problems, and therefore more skeptical of government regulations. And so, um, if that's the solution, then um, according to the solution aversion um, explanation, then uh, folks become more skeptical of climate change. Okay, so those are some of the leading kinds of, of explanations as to why we have different beliefs about climate change. And these be different beliefs operate within a uh, what scholars have called a belief system, which is a, a set of uh, connected and interrelated beliefs. And so uh, policy scholars um, using a framework called the Advocacy Coalition Framework um, have talked about these belief systems as being hierarchical, uh, meaning that there are some types of beliefs that these scholars have termed deep core. These are beliefs like the cultural theory, cultural worldviews, 
political beliefs like ideology and party attachment um, and even the new ec uh, ecological paradigm kind of pro-environmental beliefs. So deep core, these beliefs that could be influential or could influence views on a whole host of different policy issues. So these deep core beliefs are more abstract, more foundational and applicable to a host of different uh, policy issues. Uh, policy core beliefs are about specific policy areas or policy domains like climate change, uh, for example. Um, and then finally, the more narrow, less abstract beliefs are termed secondary aspects. And these are things like particular policy instruments or policy ideas to address uh, climate change. So a carbon tax versus a cap and trade versus EPA regulations versus an international agreement, right? These are all would be considered kind of secondary aspects or specific policy tools. And the idea is that these are hierarchical, that deep core beliefs influence. So your cultural worldview influences what you think about climate change, which in turn influences what type of policies that you would or would not support. Um, but another way uh, to think about beliefs and that I'm exploring in this research is um, less of a hierarchical system, although these different types of beliefs are present in the measures, as, as we'll see in, in, in the, in the uh, previous literature that I've discussed, but as opposed to seeing them as hierarchical, seeing them as a, as a network where the nodes of the network are the beliefs themselves and the edge are uh, or those uh, ties or links are the connections or the, as we'll see, the statistical associations uh, between the nodes. All right, so I'm going to move over to briefly talk about the kind of measures that, that I'm using to, to measure each of those things that I've talked about. Um, so the data for this is uh, it's getting a little uh, little gray like, like I am. So it was uh, originally taken in, in uh, October 2017. Um, and I, but even though it's, you know, it's getting a little old, I think it's still, uh, useful and still valuable. And, um, I, what we're looking at is the, is the, is the relationships themselves, which wouldn't have changed much if at all, um, over the, that time period. Uh, and then some of the things that, that I measure, uh, through the survey. So I'm using a, a nationally representative, uh, survey from the U S this was obtained through Qualtrics. Um, in 2017. And so I'm using standard sort of measures of ideology and partisanship, using some of the standard measures of the various cultural worldviews, some questions from the uh, new ecological paradigm scale, some of those what we can term as kind of policy core beliefs about climate change, whether it's happening, whether it's a risk, and whether there's a scientific consensus that gets to that kind of gateway belief literature. Uh, and then finally, uh, support for various climate policies. So I'm going to walk through each of the measures uh, quickly. Yeah. Oh, do I have a question? Oh. Okay, good. I'll keep going. Um, so the political beliefs are pretty um, standard kind of political science measures, right? Self-placement on a one to seven uh, ideological scale, strongly liberal to strong conservative. Uh, partisanship is is a combination of of a party attachment measure as, as well as a strength, how strongly they identify with that particular party, uh, which goes from one to seven as well, strong Democrat uh, to strong Republican. Um, so the cultural worldview measures, I won't go through these in depth, but I am happy to come back to these during the question and answer uh, period if there are, are questions, but um, but these have been used in, in, in several studies um, measuring cultural theory. So there's three questions or three statements rather for each cultural type. Uh, and so um, so what is typically done is you um, take those three questions and, and there are uh, uh, three statements that are um, on a one to seven strongly disagree to strongly agree scale uh, and then average those three questions to get a one to seven hierarchical scale a one to seven egalitarian scale. And then I put the the alphas there to sort of the Cronbach's alphas to show that there's sufficient scale reliability in, in each of the measures. But but some of the statements associated with 
uh, the hierarchical worldview is is you know society is in trouble because people do not obey those in authority, right? This is that grid dimension kind of measure, the importance of of rules. And then the egalitarian statement is what society needs is a fairness revolution to make the distributions of goods more equal, right? So that um, group um, orientation there. Uh, and then looking at individualist um, kinds of statements. So we are all better off when we compete as individuals, right? So agreement with that statement uh, shows um, more agreement with the individualist worldview. Uh, and then the fatalist uh, worldview, again, for the most part, succeeding in life is a matter of chance. Right? So given, you know, there's, uh, according to a fatalist, right, humans have less agency than than maybe we might like to think. Uh, and then I use um, three questions, three sort of pro-environmental orientation questions from the new e ecological paradigm scale. Balance of nature is delicate and easily upset. Humans live on a planet with very limited room and resources, and humans are seriously abusing the environment. Um, again, that shows um, sufficient scale um, reliability, combining those questions into a single measure. Uh, and then I had three beliefs about climate change measures. So uh, it's happening. So this is a negative four to four scale. So this combines uh, two questions. Is it, you know, is climate change happening? You have to know, or then how sure are you in your response? So a negative four is uh, someone that's extremely sure it is not happening to, to a four is someone that's extremely sure that it is happening. You can see the average is at a 2.37, which is somewhere around, you know, reasonably sure that it, that climate change is happening. Uh, and then there's a risk measure. Um, how much risk do you, to, um, uh, to humans and the planet, do you see uh, from climate change with a zero to 10 scale, zero being no risk, 10 extreme risk, see the average is just under seven, right? So um, certainly uh, a ways past the midpoint on the, on the risk scale. Uh, and then the final kind of climate change um, kind of policy core measure is the scientific consensus question which is a dummy variable is, is one most scientists think climate change is happening and then the zero is, is other responses. And on average, about 63% of the uh, of this particular sample uh, agreed with the scientific consensus that, that most scientists think climate change is happening. Uh, and then I had various policy approaches to address climate change, right? And this gets to that those secondary aspects, types of beliefs, but also gets to that kind of solution aversion uh, idea that it's really that it's opposition to uh, policy approaches that's driving disagreements about climate change. Uh, so some of the um, uh, measures that I had just briefly, again, this is another one to seven scale. So uh, support for an international agreement, um, support for development of renewable energy. Uh, you can see that one's the most popular. Uh, support for nuclear energy uh, is the least popular. Uh, a carbon tax um, is also not exactly as popular. Some of the other measures, uh, EPA regulations, uh, cap and trade approach, and then support for uh, geoengineering. Um, and then in terms of the network analysis, briefly. So again, the beliefs are the nodes and the connections or the edges are uh, actually partial correlation coefficients. So these are correlation coefficients that control for all of the other correlations in, in the network. So that's the, the basis of the uh, network analysis. It's uh, uh, undirected, so this is more exploratory. Uh, so it's an undirected uh, network. Uh, it's weighted by the strength of those uh, partial correlations. So when you see the results in a moment, the, um, the thickness of the lines illustrates the weights of the correlation. So a thicker line indicates a higher or stronger uh, correlation. Uh, and then it's, it's regularized using a, a lasso procedure, which helps reduce um, those um, associations or, or connections that are not that different from zero, right? So it, the small um, correlations are, are removed through the uh, lasso procedure. All right, so we'll move to the results. So first I'll show the overall network and the various connections. 
and then I'll show the between the cent centrality measure and then have some uh, concluding thoughts. Um, so this is what the network uh, looks like. So I'll, I'll leave it up for, for uh, a moment, but you can kind of see there's a little bit of, of clustering that happens. Um, and the uh, sort of relationships of the direction of the relationships in particular are, are what we might uh, expect. So again, so the blue lines are positive partial correlation coefficients. The thickness is of the lines or the strength of those um, partial correlation coefficients. The red are negative um, correlations. We, so, you know, more conservative is associated with less likely to think that there's a scientific consensus, less pro-environmental orientation, less likely to be egalitarian, right? So these kinds of relationships that we might expect. But I think there's, you know, a couple of interesting things that um, I'm I'm interested in exploring further. So again, as I mentioned, they they there are some seems to be some clustering that happens. So the cultural worldviews uh, are uh, associated with each other, and in particular, um, each of the uh, worldviews has some association with fatalism, right? Which is I think is is really interesting. Um, again, this is you know 2017, uh, which you know there's if you're not at least somewhat fatalistic uh, during this time period, then you're not really paying attention, right? So, but I think that's kind of interesting. I think that's something that that um, that I'd like to explore sort of further. And then, um, and another thing I, I would say to that too is, is this does align somewhat with Kahan and and his colleagues and co-authors' cultural cognition measure that you know combine that that kind of puts hierarchs and egalitarians on the same scale and individualists and what they call communitarians on the same scale. And so they they note relationships between the hierarchs and individualists within cultural cognition. So that's something that is um, is replicated here. But um, so we have this sort of cluster of cultural worldviews, um, another kind of cluster in the bottom right there of, of the various policy approaches, right? Except for nuclear energy, all right, it's not as as closely connected to the other kinds of policy approaches to climate change, um, but it is connected to individualism, um, fatalism, um, as well. Which which is the fatalism is is kind of interesting, but individualism makes makes sense. I mean, we've seen in the literature some support among individualists and hierarchs for uh, nuclear energy. And then uh, partisanship and ideology are closely associated, and, and they are also associated with um, hierarchy and individualists uh, in ways that, that we would expect from previous literature, and also negatively associated with egalitarianism, which we would also expect. Um, the climate beliefs are closely connected to scientific consensus, whether it's happening, a risk. And it's also connected to the, the pro-environmental orientation as measured by the, the NEP scale, which is also kind of interesting. Um, so uh, beyond that, I also looked at this measure of betweenness centrality, which again, this, this betweenness looks at where the beliefs sit on the path between other beliefs. So in that way, these beliefs kind of act as, as the bridge uh, between other beliefs. Um, and as you know, we, we might kind of expect from this uh, argument about about cultural worldviews representing these kinds of deep core beliefs that shape other beliefs. Um, as um, uh, you know, as we might expect from that uh, kind of literature and then the kind of cultural cognition literature as well, um, that that is more out somewhat, at least in these results, right, that egalitarianism, individualism are the ones that have the highest kind of betweenness centrality, uh, followed by risk, fatalism, and then um, various climate policies, which gets to that kind of solution aversion idea, right? So international agreements, EPA regulations, carbon tax, right? Those are the more kind of controversial or polarizing kinds of climate policy solutions. And those um, tend to drive, um, uh, or at least according to this analysis, be closely connected to other beliefs within this broader belief system. 
Uh, so finally, again, this is um, you know, still kind of pre preliminary, still working through this, but some of the um, uh, insights from the structure itself is the ways in which the various cultural worldviews, political beliefs, uh, NEPA or uh, NEP and, 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 and climate beliefs and climate policies all tended to cluster uh, the way in which kind of nuclear energy is was kind of not uh, closely associated as much with any of the kinds of climate uh, other kinds of climate beliefs. And then the um, measures of centrality or these sort of cultural worldviews, climate change risk and climate policies tended to be those beliefs uh, that were most central. Um, and then some things I'm kind of thinking about for for next steps, and I'm I'm looking forward to the the Q and A uh, to help me think about that as well. Is is you know how does this? So this is a belief system in the aggregate, right? How does this match or map with an individual's belief system, right? Can we take the belief system of an individual, and is it reflected in an, in an aggregate way as 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 this? Is kind of presented, or is or is this is it something different, right? So how do we think about that relationship between an individual's belief system um, and uh, this aggregate measure of a belief system uh, that I have here? And then you know how do we think about learning or changes in belief systems? Um, and what you know, and another way to think about that too is is what kinds of levers or buttons can we kind of push to change? Um, to change those beliefs, right? And so that's, uh, or to change the overall structure of the of the network, or can we, right? So that's something else I'm kind of thinking about uh, moving ahead. Uh, but with that, uh, thank you.